Okay, James, what motivated you to start your school of hard knocks? Two things. Okay. I was very blessed with great mentors in my lives growing up. Okay. A lot of our peers didn't have that. So we wanted to go seek out the best industry experts from every industry to figure out how the most successful people got to where they were. Yeah. The second thing was, is I saw the value in the creator economy. In 2021, it was going to be a $500 billion industry. So I wanted to get my piece of the pie and build one of the biggest media channels in the planet right you're, now. You're doing it, man. So three years now. Yes, sir. Three years. Three years. So this, that was during the pandemic. Yes, sir. So a lot of people were reeling back. People were collecting COVID checks. Uh, you weren't. So what was your thought process to start this channel during COVID? Well, first of all, I was going to school at the university. University of Texas, where a lot of people, when they go to college, they have that mindset that I'm just going to go to school, party, kind of do my thing. My thing was, is I knew I had to sacrifice when I was at college. So when I wasn't in class, I was building. I was going every single day downtown Austin to the financial district, the tech district, to talk to the most successful people. One viral video led to another. We were able to interview people like Mark Cuban, the president of Nike, the CEO of Frito-Lay, CEO of 7-Eleven, Gary Vee, Grant Cardone, everybody, man. We got everybody on the channel. It was that sacrifice, and I knew that I wanted more, and I didn't want to have to work for anybody after college, and I figured, found me to do it. Media was my industry. You no, know, you're doing a Dale Carnegie thing. You know how he wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence yes, People? Yeah. But you're doing it for a modern age. What's a common denominator you see with all the millionaires and millionaires you've been talking to? Leverage. They understand the value of leverage. The only way people are able to scale to do seven figures, eight, nine figures is that they're masters at putting the right people in the right places. If you try to do everything on your own, you know, you just, you can't scale that way. One of my favorite quotes I've ever heard is, I'd rather have a slice of the pie than 100% of a grape. So if you have a value offer to other people where they can come in and help you, give them a chunk of change. Don't be afraid to kind of let go. You got to let the reins off certain things. That was the biggest thing that enabled us to help grow. Interesting. Yeah, because sometimes that, pie, that slice of the pie is a big pie. Yes, sir. Versus 100% of a crumb. Right. When you're um, inspired to do this, what, what were, you, were you raised in entrepreneurship? Uh, what, what inspired you to, to have this type of uh, uh, to, awareness? To be honest with you, no. My dad had an incredible career in the military. Didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs, but was raised with you know just immense discipline and that, like nothing was ever going to be handed to you, right? A lot of our generation though, is kind of accused of having that entitlement mentality mm -hmm. where they think that that job or that opportunity is going to be handed to them. Yeah. Whereas me, I was raised that it's like you have to go and get it yourself, right? A closed mouth doesn't get fed. Yeah. And so I was really inspired. It was initially my brother. He moved out to Austin, started to work with a lot of big companies because he had won like a world championship with Microsoft Excel. Long story there, but it was really seeing what my brother was doing. I went from wanting to go the military route and go in special ops. Really? I wanted to go all in on business because yeah. I, I, th I was, thought it was going to be like my dad and go to West Point and go to one of the academies. Yeah, you you like, had the physique for special ops, man. Yes, sir. Yeah, like so when, when you're seeing all these uh, entrepreneurs, what's the average age of the guys that are millionaires that are very successful that you can see? Because there's a lot of BS out there. Yeah. You know, sometimes people think there's get rich quick and your 20s get rich quick and your 40s. Has there been like an average age or an average time frame of, of them being in a business? So uh, everybody's different, right? Like you have the people that, you know, hit in their 20s and made that happen like a legit and honest way, right? Now there's a lot to be said about a lot of people are posing and acting like mm -hmm. that they have a lot mm -hmm. of money and have made a lot, but it's really all for show. I would say late 30s, you know, to be honest with you, I think the average age of a millionaire is like 50 something years old. Wow. A lot of, it, it is. Like wow. I think statistically it's, yeah. it's in their 50s. Old guys like me. Right. <laughs> Now, I think it may be a little bit different for yeah. people that, you know, were <clears throat> lifelong entrepreneurs. Like if you start out entrepreneurship coming out of college and it's like, you know, you may, if you figure it out and you hit yeah. and one of your businesses that you start, then you have, may have a higher chance of doing that. But I'd say, I mean, I know the average age of a millionaire is like 50 years old or something like that. It's a lot older than people think, hmm. but it's like the whole get rich quick thing. I don't, I don't really believe in I mean, they, could you get lucky with an investment here or there or a business that takes off? You get in the right vehicle. Sure. But it's honestly, it, I, I like to play the long game, yeah. especially in media. Everybody wants to get rich quick. But the problem with that is they dilute their brand equity. So then everything falls apart. Yeah. Whereas like we've had to give up tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars to promote various things, go into different business ideas with people, all to preserve the brand. Because ultimately it's the long game. We're not in this to make a couple hundred thousand yeah. million bucks. It's like we want this to be a, a massive media property. So it's interesting, after a thousand millionaires you've interviewed, Over you're thousand. still not bought into the get rich quick type of thing. That's awesome. So is there a common industry that a lot of these guys make their money in? It's it's different, right? So I, I would say, you know, the three big ones for people that go out and work and notice start an entrepreneurship, obviously, you know, finance, real estate, and tech. But I would say for me personally, I, Obviously, everybody's a little bit different. I don't think it's a very easy industry to break into, yeah. but I recommend everybody go into some form of like media because the revenue multiples in a media company, it's unlike anything else yeah. other than software, right? If you have a media company that's doing a million dollars a year in revenue, chances are you can sell that thing for 10 to 15 times the revenue that it's doing. There's not a lot of, a lot of industries that have those kind of revenue multiples. So I think that especially with just how everybody's going away from traditional media, everything's going more on demand. If you can find a way to build some sort of brand that's decentralized, that's, you know, not necessarily that traditional media, I think that that's that's definitely the way to go. I like I like media. I like media. It's, everybody's different, 
your vehicle was insurance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, worked very well for you in the house for a lot of people. Most millionaires are in the insurance and slash real estate business. I know those are the two main ones. But for me personally, I think right now, if you can get into it, I, I like media. That's that's my view. So one last question. If you were to do this all over again, what have you learned the last three years doing this that you would adjust and do differently? The absolute number one biggest thing that I would have done starting out is realizing that the most important thing that you can do as a creator and when you're when you're starting out on social media is own that data as soon as possible. The data. Because if, because if TikTok goes, Right, we have 1.7 million followers on TikTok. If we lose TikTok, well, there's 1.7 million people. But if you own that data, you have them in an email list, those people never go with you. Then, like I said, I mean, there's newsletters. People have a couple hundred thousand people on a newsletter that are selling for 10 to $50 million. It's yeah. like, that's unheard of. And people don't realize that just an email list can sell for that kind of money. But if you can know that, hey, this person, John, who follows me is a single father. He's 35 years old. He loves to invest in real estate. He makes $100,000 a year. That's very valuable to companies and people that want to advertise. Owning the data would be the fastest thing that I would do in terms of from a content perspective, I think the biggest thing that we did well is right out of the gate, it was all about consistency. It's quantity versus quality early on. I tell people that you don't, unless you're making Steven Spielberg quality content, you need to be posting at least every single day. Once you find that winning piece of content, 10 exit and double down and don't look back, but make little pivots along the way, right? We were stuck at 150,000 followers on Instagram for probably like three to five months. The interview niche that we were in started to get really saturated. So we had to differentiate ourselves. We had to go up to people organically on the street. We wouldn't even introduce ourselves. We'd just go right into it. And that type of content, that more raw feel so it's, it's finding out how you can really differentiate yourself don't try and reinvent the wheel it's a big mistake that people make is they just like people think when they start a business they have to start some new tech company or something like that when in reality it's no find something that's proven that you can do right insurance home services stuff like that right so that's kind of like how, how i feel at least but don't reinvent the wheel be consistent and don't get discouraged either and i always say this this is a quote i always leave with people going viral is like hitting the lottery but creating consistent quality content is like investing in your future so Bam. consistency you know that's well, last thing is. you created a, 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 a you just created a community yes sir Tell us about it. Just launched a community called the School of Mentors. Every single week I'm posting a live call with eight, nine, and even 10 figure entrepreneurs where you guys will be able to hop on these calls and ask them questions about your career, your lives, and your business, right? Mentorship, that's the only shortcut to success in today's world. There's, there are no shortcuts to success, but mentorship, finding out how people actually got there, that's the way to do it. So we've hosted some incredible calls so far, and we've also been filming master classes with some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the entire world on learning how to sell, how to market, how to become and, and you know preserve yourself as a CEO of a big company, right? Right? digital closing, all of these things. So the school right. of mentors, only $30 a month. I mean, the value in there is just, I, I, I'm, I'm very transparent about price just because it's the value there is just ridiculous, you yeah. know? So it's that's good. the school of mentors, guys. Come on, man. So Go check it out, guys, man. Awesome. That's good, man.